Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Throughout history, in virtually every culture, witches have played a role in the spirituality and history of civilization. Whether they were revered as healers and practitioners of arts beyond our understanding, or hunted as strange and dangerous creatures seeking to do harm to society, more often than not, witches were met with fear, anger, and, ultimately, death. We'll look at some of the strangest ways accused witches have been laid to an unnatural arrest throughout history in this episode of Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Tuscany, Italy, where there lies an 800-year-old gravesite that is believed by archaeologists to have been an entire graveyard for witches. After discovering bodies with playing die, an illegal practice of the time, in shallow graves, they also uncovered the remains of two women who had been buried with 13 nails driven into their jaw. It's unknown exactly why they did this, but experts suspect it was a way to prevent the corpse from uttering curses should she ever come back from the dead. In Warwickshire, England, there stands an odd assortment of stones referred to as the Rollwright Stones. According to local lore, they are believed to be petrified remains of a long-ago King of England and his faithful men turned to stone by a fearsome witch. In 2015, during an archaeological dig near the stones, a skeleton, soon to be nicknamed Rita of Rollwright, was discovered. An estimated 1,400 years old, the woman was found with a bronze vessel, a piece of amethyst, a bead of amber, and a spindle whorl indicating she was a Saxon spiritual woman of high status. While the dates of the stones and Rita don't match, it has not stopped some speculating that she may have been the legendary witch who possessed the power to turn men to stone. A very odd grave has been lying in wait in Venice since the 16th century. It was discovered in 2006 and contained the body of a woman buried alongside plague victims. Her burial was strange, however, as they found a brick forced into her mouth, a common practice of the time used on the bodies of suspected vampires as a way of halting the spread of supernatural disease. Stranger still, it is now thought that she was also a witch. Her age is part of what leads scientists to believe she may have been accused of witchcraft, since women of the time who lived past the age of 40, the average life expectancy of the period, were thought to have dabbled in the dark arts to extend their length of life and cheat death. Recently discovered in a tomb in northern Israel was the body of a 12,000-year-old woman believed to be a witch or she-shaman dating from the prehistoric Natufian civilization. Within the tomb, archaeologists found 50 complete tortoise shells, the pelvis of a leopard, the wingtip of a golden eagle, 
the tail of a cow, two marten skulls, the forearm of a wild boar, and a human foot. Curiously, the woman had been covered by ten heavy stones designed to protect the body from wild animals, however, there are some historians who have suggested the stones were also used to trap the witch's spirit within the grave. In 18th century Scotland, Lilius Aidy found herself accused of witchcraft by the townsfolk of her home. Coerced into confessing to being the devil's wife by the church, she died in prison before she could be tried, sentenced, and burned for witchcraft. While most witches were dumped into shallow graves, Aidy's burial was a little unorthodox. She was buried in muddy sand on the shore during low tide with a stone placed over her body. Her remains have since disappeared into the sea, though the stone slab remains. One theory is that she killed herself as the common practice was to bury suicide victims in the muddy shore as to not disturb consecrated ground. In Lancashire, England, in the unusual grave of yet another witch, Meg Shelton, who died in 1705, is better known to history as the Witch of Woodplumpton. Accused of witchcraft by her fellow villagers, after her death they went to extreme lengths to prevent her from ever rising again. Her burial may seem normal at first glance, but according to legend, it is a very odd one. The townspeople buried her vertically, head first in the ground in a small, tight shaft so that if she tried to dig her way out, she'd be going the wrong way. They then covered the hole with a large stone so that she may never escape. The stone remains to this day in the churchyard of St. Anne's Church, accompanied by a small plaque warning visitors that the Witch of Woodplumpton lies buried beneath. Rebecca Nurse is probably one of the most famous victims of the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. Nurse's trial and conviction was like any other, unjust and full of heresy. She was calm and collected at the gallows and buried in the traditional shallow grave of a witch without incident. It was what happened later that was more interesting. Witches were denied Christian burials, but her family snuck to the gravesite after dark and unearthed her remains. They then moved her body to a burial site on the nurse homestead. As for the others, many of their burial locations have been lost to history as no records were ever kept or even made. Today, a monument sits upon Nurse's grave, a tangible reminder of the consequences of history's violent response to superstition and fear of the unknown. Emile L'Angeli was in love, or so he said. He'd been secretly seeing Madeline Smith for months. She was young, beautiful, and from a well-to-do Glasgow family. Since Emile was a lowly warehouse clerk, Madeline's father forbid the relationship. It was 1857 Scotland, after all. Of course, Madeline agreed to keep seeing him. How could she resist? A mutual friend let the lovers meet at her house, or Emile would visit Madeline's bedroom window after her parents had gone to sleep. When they couldn't talk in person, Emile and Madeline wrote each other letters, explicit letters. But Madeline's family had other plans for their eldest daughter. She eventually became engaged to a man named William Harper Minoche, who was from their same social circle. When she broke the bad news to Emile, she asked him to destroy her letters so they would never be discovered. But Emile refused. He told Madeline if she didn't run away with him, he would send the letters to her father, ruining her new relationship and shaming her family. While Madeline's future crumbled, Emile kept up appearances, telling friends they were still in love. He claimed to be visiting her bedroom window, where they talked about their future while sipping hot cocoa and coffee. After one of the supposed secret evenings, Emile's landlady noticed he looked a little ill. The next day, the two had tea, where Emile made a strange statement. He declared he would always love Madeline, even if she poisoned him. Over the next three weeks, Emile got sicker, 
until one morning his landlady found him dead. An autopsy showed copious amounts of arsenic in his stomach, along with a dark brown liquid, like chocolate. Madeline's letters were soon discovered and she was accused of poisoning Emile, but no one could testify that they had seen Madeline and Emile together during the last weeks of his life. His friends assumed they were still meeting based on what Emile had said, but Madeline adamantly denied it. It was her word against a dead man's. Emile had already attempted blackmail. Could he now be framing Madeline for murder from beyond the grave? The jury came back with a not proven verdict, meaning they didn't think Madeline was innocent, but the evidence didn't prove she was guilty either. Soon after the trial ended, Madeline broke off her engagement to William and moved away to escape public scrutiny. She eventually landed in the United States, where she assumed a new identity and died without anyone knowing the true story behind her deadly affair. Up next, two sisters rebel against their depressing family life by diving into witchcraft, and they soon learn it was not a wise decision. And in 1827, young Maria Martin slipped into a red barn to meet her secret lover, the very last time she would be seen alive. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. In March 1826, a love affair blossomed between 24-year-old Maria Martin and 22-year-old William Corder. Just one year later, their secret romance ended in slaughter and became one of the most notorious murder cases in English history. The couple hailed from Polstead, a small town in Suffolk, England. William Corder, the son of a farmer, had a reputation for being a ladies' man and troublemaker. He once swindled his father out of his own pigs and helped steal livestock from another farmer. The comely Martin was no stranger to romance either. She already birthed two children. One was from William's older brother, though the baby died as an infant. The other was a baby boy whose father wanted nothing to do with the illegitimate child apart from sending money from time to time. William preferred to keep the relationship secret. Yet in 1827, the pair had a child of their own. Though the offspring died soon after birth, young William still seemed intent on marrying Maria. Alas, Maria had a less-than-favorable reputation in the community. William spoke of rumors that authorities wished to prosecute her for having bastard children. So William suggested they elope. The pair hatched their plan in front of Maria's stepmother, Anne Martin. They were to meet at the Red Barn, a popular landmark located on Barnfield Hill less than a mile from the Martin home. Afterward, they would leave for Ipswich. A date was set, Wednesday, May 16, 1827. William appeared eager to marry his sweetheart. As the secret wedding day arrived, however, he delayed not once, but twice. Two days later, William visited Maria and, as witnessed by Maria's stepmother, told her that they had to flee at once. A warrant, he claimed, was out for her arrest. 
Historical records indicate that no such warrant had been issued. Nevertheless, William's words frightened Maria. She feared being seen, so William convinced her to disguise herself as a man. The two were to meet in the Red Barn, where William would wait for her with a disguise. They would then flee to Ipswich, as originally planned. The unsuspecting Maria did as she was told and made her way to the Red Barn. It was the last time she would be seen alive. Maria vanished after that day in May. When family and friends questioned William, he claimed she had simply left for Ipswich ahead of him. Inquiries continued, and William made himself scarce, leaving town altogether. He wrote to the Martin family, claiming that he and Maria were indeed married and living together on the Isle of Wight. Various excuses were made as to Maria's silence. She was ill, her hand hurt, and she could not write a letter. She did write a letter, but it must have been lost in the mail. Months went by, and the suspicions of the Martin family only grew. It was around this time that stepmother Anne spoke of troubling dreams. She had visions of Maria's murder, her body being buried in the Red Barn. On April 19, 1928, Anne's husband made his way to the barn to soothe his wife's troubled mind. As instructed, he dug in one of the grain storage bins, and what he discovered was shockingly consistent with Anne's vision. Wrapped in a sack were human remains. While the body had decomposed, family members successfully identified the body as Maria's thanks to the preserved hair and clothing. A tooth missing from Maria's mouth was also missing from the corpse's jaw, and one glaring piece of evidence implicated Maria's former lover. William's signature green handkerchief was wound tightly around the body's neck. The constable of Polstead set out to find William Corder. The man it turned out put little effort in covering his tracks. Authorities secured an address through one of William's friends. With the help of London policeman James Lee, they soon tracked down the suspect in London. William had established a new life in England's capital as the master of a boarding house known as Everly Grove. He had recently married Mary Moore, a woman he met courtesy of a singles ad in the paper. Lee devised a sting operation to catch the suspect. He posed as a father, inquiring about boarding his daughter, then cornered Corder and notified him of the charges. William feigned innocence of knowing about Maria and her murder. He was taken to Suffolk and stood trial at Shire Hall, Bury St. Edmunds, where he pled not guilty. By then, news of the case spread throughout the region. Crowds converged upon the courthouse while media outlets reported on every little detail. The throng grew so large that spectators who wished to view the trial had to be chosen by ticket. The evidence against William Corder was overwhelming. Maria's stepmother recounted the events leading up to the murder, the stalled elopement and claims of a warrant, William's luring of Maria into the Red Barn on the last night she was seen alive, Maria's father testified about discovering the body, and Maria's little brother claimed he saw William with a pistol and a pickaxe on the day of the murder. Lee also found the pistols, incriminating letters, and a French passport at William's new residence. The precise cause of death was hard to determine. The body had gunshot wounds, there was William's handkerchief around the neck, and a gash to the eye that may or may not have been a posthumous wound resulting from a pickaxe. As for motive, prosecutors suggested William was eager to get rid of Maria because she knew too much about his criminal activities and that they quarreled over the child support she received from the father of her child. Additional rumors swirled over the mysterious death of Maria and William's infant. The baby was supposed to have been interred in Sudbury, though no record of the burial or trace of a proper burial at all could be found. The jury deliberated for a mere 35 minutes. They found William Corder guilty. The judge sentenced him to hang. In a grisly twist of the era, the judge also declared that William's body would be dissected for medical study. William fretted over confessing as he awaited his execution. Finally, at the behest of his wife as well as the prison warden and governor, he admitted to the death of Maria Martin. 
He claimed that he had been quarreling with his former lover when he accidentally shot her in the eye. He also wrote in his confession that the two argued about someone discovering the actual burial site of their child. On August 11, 1828, a weak William Corder stepped onto the gallows. He was hanged before a crowd of 7,000 or 20,000, depending on which version you believe. By the time of the hanging, the tale of the Red Barn murder had swept beyond England. Numerous plays, novels, and tabloid-style newspapers chronicled the events. Charles Dickens reluctantly included the story in his magazine All the Year Round. Many, many years later, American songwriter Tom Waits penned Murder in the Red Barn, a song that some critics suggest was inspired by the sensational story. Supposed locks of Maria's hair and strands of the rope that hung William Corder were readily purchased by buyers. Around 5,000 people viewed Corder's body after the hanging. His body was then taken to Cambridge for an autopsy in front of students and physicians. Surgeons conducting a phrenological examination noted that the killer's skull was developed in the areas of secretiveness, acquisitiveness, destructiveness, and a lack of benevolence. The Red Barn and nearby Martin Cottage became tourist attractions. The barn itself was stripped clear by souvenir hunters and much of the wood was turned into toothpicks. Tourists chipped away at Maria's tombstone until it was little more than a rocky nub. After the dissection was complete, Corder's skeleton went on display in a museum at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. His skin was tanned by a surgeon and bound forever to a book containing an account of the murder. Fitting indeed. When I was a young child, we moved into a house in a pretty bad part of town. We were homeschooled, which was basically illegal in California, so we weren't allowed to just run around the neighborhood during the day and we weren't really doing very much schooling during the day. Of course, that meant we were bored. Add to that the fact that my parents' marriage was in a terrible place, my father was a minor drug dealer, and my mother was seriously depressed, our life was a certain type of hell. So simultaneously, as an outlet for frustration, a way of rebellion and natural inclination, I and one of my older sisters became very interested in magic and witchcraft. I went the way of my ancestors, who were of Norse descent, and began worshiping the old Viking gods, especially Freya. My sister also practiced magic and started out by worshiping Freya but ended up venturing down darker paths. It was right around this time that I started to have hallucinations, the most frequent of which were these hordes of dark figures which at the time I called zombies, but I think that was just for a lack of a better word because looking back on my visions, they were just black and menacing beings. There were times I heard voices or felt someone touching me. My little sister would see a recurring thing in her closet, which she said looked like a cross between a man and a vulture. My sister and I were avoided because we became known as witches in our neighborhood, which wasn't entirely bad because that meant our bullies and harassers would leave us alone if we threatened spells to cast upon them. I truly believe that the house became haunted or inhabited by demonic forces because of our actions. As time went on, things outside of our control forced my family to move from California to Kentucky to live with my very religious aunt and uncle, which is where I became converted to Christ renounced and ended my affair with witchcraft. My life took a very drastic turn, and I'm now a fairly happy person with a family of my own. I feel I still retain a tiny amount of magic, only because I'm able to tell when those I love and are close to are near. I can tell when my husband is going to be home early, without him even calling me to let me know. I know it's my mother-in-law on the phone before the caller ID says it's her, the day my mother had a stroke, I had to leave in the middle of a church meeting because I became overwhelmed by an unshakable feeling that something was wrong. 
Minutes later, my sister called me to tell me that they were taking Mom to the ER and that they didn't know what was wrong but that we shouldn't worry because the EMTs were sure it wasn't anything serious. But I knew it was. When the ER doctor said he didn't think it was a stroke, I knew it was. Then they called in a neurologist, just to be sure, and it was, in fact, a stroke. Afterward, I felt terrified but calm at the same time. I knew we weren't going to lose her, but that it was going to be a long and hard road. Today, she's walking unassisted and is learning how to write with her right hand. She was left-handed before, and her left side was the side affected. She can read still and is just as quick-witted and mentally strong as she ever was. I can also tell when my children are lying to me or are in trouble. Of course, that last bit can be choked up to mother's intuition. But isn't that a bit of its own magic? When Weird Darkness Returns was the 1971 Lloyds Bank safety deposit robbery a covert operation to retrieve compromising photos of royalty? We'll take a closer look at the Baker Street robbery up next. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. With the robbers broadcasting their crime live over the airwaves, it's a mystery why the police never caught the Baker Street Gang red-handed. The safety deposit raid in 1971 is one of the most baffling in British criminal history, and rumors that its true purpose has been covered up by the British establishment persist to this day. The problem is they should never have gotten away with a penny. In the early hours of Saturday, September 11, 1971, as the robbers were tunneling into the safety deposit vault at Lloyd's Bank on Baker Street, a nearby amateur radio ham was listening to their every word. The gang were using walkie-talkies to communicate, and radio hobbyist Robert Rowlands had accidentally turned into their transmissions. Rowlands notified the police, who were slow to believe his claim that he had happened upon a genuine robbery in progress. Eventually persuaded, they finally set out on a frantic search of hundreds of London's banks in an attempt to thwart the raid. They didn't succeed. Rowlands had informed the police that the range of the transmissions meant the robbers must be nearby, within about a mile of his Wimple Street flat. For reasons never adequately explained, though, 
they decided to spread the net out to a 10-mile radius instead, vastly expanding the number of banks they would have to search. With limited resources and the need to ask the permission of each bank before searching, they failed to stop the gang in time. The raid at Baker Street branch of Lloyds Bank was then Britain's biggest and most ambitious, the thieves crowbarring open 260 boxes and making away with an estimated 30 million pounds in today's money. It caused a seismic shockwave across the banking industry and panic amongst the rich and powerful clientele who had their most private and possibly even illegal valuables stored in the vaults. From the beginning, it was clear this was no ordinary heist. It was far more complex, elaborate, and well-planned than anything that had ever been seen in the country before. The gang had leased a leather goods shop two doors down from the bank and spent three months studiously digging a tunnel from the basement of the shop beneath the neighboring chicken inn and into the vault. The robbery required a hitherto unseen level of patience and expertise from the thieves, utilizing then hard-to-obtain radio communications equipment, explosives, expensive digging machinery, and even a thermal lance. It was a professional and carefully planned operation, but one that raised some nagging questions that have never been satisfactorily answered. Because these robbers weren't the criminal masterminds their unbelievable heist made them appear, they were small-time crooks, petty thieves, and conmen who had never done anything even remotely on the scale of the Baker Street job before. How had the gang managed to graduate to such big-league criminality with such apparent ease? Even the culprits knew what they had pulled off was impressive, writing, let's see how Sherlock Holmes solves this one on the wall, a reference to the Conan Doyle story The Red-Headed League, which involves the detective foiling a similar bank robbery. The Metropolitan Police didn't need the world's greatest detective in the end, though, and at least some of the culprits were eventually caught. One of the gang, Desmond Wolfe, had made the elementary mistake of hiring the leather goods shop that served as their base under his own name. Police eventually tracked down the other gang members from their associates with Wolf. Anthony Gavin, Thomas Stevens, and Reginald Tucker were subsequently arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 12 years in jail for their roles in the Baker Street robbery. Unlike many other high-profile criminals, such as the men behind the Great Train robbery, the gang have remained resolutely discreet over the years. Despite masterminding the most audacious crime in British criminal history, none of the men have ever talked. No big paydays from the tabloids to tell their story. No lucrative book deals. Quietly released a few years later, they all disappeared into obscurity. But it seemed none of the men were ever short of money. Nothing taken from the robbery, money, jewels, or anything else was ever recovered. Had the gang somehow managed to retrieve their booty after their release right under the noses of the police? Or had they been bought off by somebody? It was questions like this that began a series of rumors, some probably myths, others legitimate, and troubling questions that remain unanswered. Was there more to this daring crime than met the eye? Did the British government even slap a gagging notice on the press to prevent them reporting the real truth behind the robbery. Police always suspected that not only were there others involved, but that there must have been a mastermind behind such a daring raid. Such was its expense and complexity it seems unlikely to have been hatched by such small-time operators without the help from somebody. The question, though, is who? Speculation about who was really behind the raid has led to some sensational theories. What if the real target of the robbers was not loot, but something even more valuable? After the raid, many of the clientele did not come forward to report what they had lost. Safety deposit boxes were designed to be discreet and were often used to store sensitive items and documents that their owners would often rather not even admit existed. Was the target something so sensitive it could be used to blackmail one of the powerful clients? 
the most famous version of this theory was turned into an entertaining film in 2008 called The Bank Job. Based loosely on the Baker Street robbery, it alleges that British intelligence had hired the gang to raid the safety deposit boxes at the bank to retrieve pornographic photographs of a prominent member of royalty. Although not named, rumors have circulated for decades that this royal was the Queen's sister, Princess Margaret. Margaret had already skirted dangerously close to scandal in the 60s and 70s. She was notorious for her loush lifestyle and association with several disreputable and criminal figures. It is highly probable MI5, the UK's internal intelligence service, was at least keeping tabs on Margaret. Was the robbery an operation to prevent a highly damaging royal scandal from becoming public? The bank job film claims to be more than just speculation. Writers Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenis say they based their script on inside information from a journalist who was involved with the story back in 1971. In the film, an underworld figure named Michael X is storing sexual photographs of Margaret taken on her holiday home in Mustique in the Baker Street vault with the intention of using them to blackmail the British establishment into turning a blind eye to his criminal activities. Did this explain how well-funded the operation was? The way the police seemed to be reluctant to catch the gang? And the supposed D-notice placed on the press preventing them from reporting what really happened? Despite her immense privileges, Princess Margaret was a tragic figure. The Queen's younger sister would never become monarch herself and failed to carve any kind of meaningful role for herself in the royal hierarchy. Bereft of a sense of purpose, the young princess would increasingly lose herself in a life of hedonism and become notorious for her drinking, partying, and a succession of lovers. At her hideaway on the Caribbean island of Mustique, Margaret would entertain a string of young men society figures, and even those from the criminal fraternity like infamous Cockney gangster John Bindon. Tales of Margaret's exploits on Mustique are legendary. On one occasion, she photographed several of her male friends naked on the beach. Another time, Bindon performed his famous party trick involving hanging five half-pint glasses from his penis, much to Margaret's delight. Some biographers now believe Margaret even had an affair with Bindon, something he would occasionally brag about himself. Whatever the case, she had already compromised herself. A photograph of Margaret with the then-wanted criminal Bindon was widely circulated in Fleet Street, although not actually printed by the press until many years later. Such a photograph would have been a scandal in itself, but did even more salacious pictures exist? Considering what we already know about Princess Margaret, it's certainly plausible photographs extreme enough to be used for blackmail or cause a major public scandal may have existed. In The Bank Job, exactly such photographs are in the possession of an underworld figure named Michael X. Real name Michael DeFredius, Michael X was a London gangster, drug dealer, and slum landlord in the 1960s and 70s. X became a minor celebrity in the late 60s by setting up a London branch of the Black Power Movement and was briefly feted in the press by such figures as John Lennon and Yoko Ono. According to the film, Michael X kept compromising photographs of Margaret taken on Mystique in his safety deposit box at the Baker Street Bank. He planned to use them as blackmail material to prevent prosecution for his criminal activities. Fearful of a major national scandal if they were to be made public, MI5 orders the raid to retrieve them. Shortly after the robbery in 1971, Michael X was allowed to leave England for his native Trinidad, despite the fact he was due in court on charges of extortion. A few months later, the commune he started there burned down in mysterious circumstances. The story had fatal consequences for Michael X. When police found the hacked bodies of two of its members buried in shallow graves on the property, he was charged with their murders and hung for the crime in 1975. Although little or no hard evidence exists in the public domain for the scenario depicted in the film, the writers of The Bank Job, Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenace, 
say they had a Deep Throat-style informant who was involved in the original investigation to confirm the events depicted in the film. The informant was actually Evening Standard journalist George McIndo, who claimed to have learned about the salacious photographs after getting to know two members of the Baker Street Gang in the 1970s. With none of the men themselves talking and Michael X dead, it's clearly hard to verify what McIndo told the writers. One curious piece of circumstantial evidence does exist, however. Michael X's MI5 file is locked up until the year 2054, 83 years after the robbery and 79 years after his death. The secrecy over the file of an obscure London gangster seems unwarranted. Could it be there is something so explosive in those files that they might still be embarrassing decades after everyone involved is dead? In later years, a far more sinister variation on the royal scandal theory has emerged. Brian Reeder, a gang member not captured by police in 1971, says the men found sickening images of child sex abuse involving prominent politicians in the safety deposit boxes. The now elderly reader made the claims at his trial for involvement in another famous robbery, the 2015 heist of the safety deposit boxes at London's Hatton Garden. He says the gang at Baker Street were so disgusted by the pictures they left them scattered out on the floor of the vault for the police to find. If this is true, the resulting scandal would far eclipse even salacious pictures of a prominent royal. Allegations that there is a systematic cover-up of a child sex ring at the highest level of British politics persists even today. If evidence for such a ring had been found scattered on the floor of a bank vault in 1971, it would certainly have been concealed by the authorities. The role of British intelligence in such a scenario could take two forms. The first is that the raid was a stunt orchestrated by them to provide blackmail opportunities against high-ranking politicians. More likely is that, on discovering the material in the aftermath of the robbery, MI5 swooped in to aid the cover-up and ensure a scandal did not break that would potentially bring down the British government itself. On the morning of Saturday the 11th of September 1971, the Metropolitan Police knew two solid facts about the bank robbery currently in progress somewhere in London. Firstly, the culprits were attempting to tunnel their way inside a safety deposit vault. And secondly, the vault was located within a mile of the flat of CB Radio Ham Robert Rowlands. If the police had used that information, they would almost certainly have caught the men before they even made it into the bank. Instead, they sent their men on a wild goose chase of more than 170 banks across 10 miles of northwest London massively decreasing the odds that they would find the correct location in time. Despite this, sometime on Sunday morning police did search the Baker Street branch of Lloyd's Bank. With the gang just a few feet away behind the 15-inch thick door of the vault, the bank was dismissed as the location of the robbery because there were no signs of a break-in. Whether this was an honest mistake, incompetence, or a deliberate blind eye being turned is now impossible to say. But with the police knowing from the transmissions on Roland's radio that the gang was trying to dig their way directly into the vault rather than go in through the front, it is staggering that this search was deemed sufficient to dismiss the bank as the possible location of the robbery. One of the most persistent rumors about the Lloyds Bank robbery is that a D-notice was placed on the press to prevent them fully reporting the details of the crime. A D-notice is a request from the government to the press not to report on a specific event that is deemed a risk to national security. Whilst technically voluntary, the UK press would rarely break a D-notice, and several are still used and in effect today. It is not contested that such a request was made to the press regarding their reporting of the Baker Street robbery. The robbery was known about for almost two days before news of it was broken on the morning of Monday the 13th of September. During this period, it is thought a D-notice was in effect to prevent any reporting possibly tipping the criminals off. The heist was then widely reported for a while. The BBC and most of the national press reported on the crime. After that, news of the raid virtually vanished from the UK media. 
Radio ham Robert Rollins, whose recordings of the robbery first alerted police, says his tapes and radio equipment were then seized and a D-notice placed on further reporting. Unlike similar heists, which have remained in the headlines for months and years afterwards, very little was reported about the robbery again until the publicity generated by the release of the movie The Bank Job in 2008. One small story did appear in The Times in 1973, reporting on the conviction of the three men involved in the raid, but this looks like a curiously scant return for such a sensational crime. In recent years, the tabloid Daily Mirror has revealed that they and other major newspapers at the time were approached by senior government officials and asked to drop the story. It's hard to understand why they would do this if there wasn't some element of national security involved. No other major bank robbery in British history has faced the reporting restrictions that seem to be evident here. Was this to cover up the robbery's true intent or to cover up what the thieves say they found in the safety deposit boxes and left out for the police to find? MI5 is renowned in the intelligence world for its skill, efficiency, and cunning. When someone working on an MI5 covert operation leases out a shop as a front for their illegal activities, they generally don't do it in their own name, allowing for their swift capture by the police. Yet that's exactly what gang member Desmond Wolfe did. With a tunnel leading straight from the bank vault to the basement of the Lassac leather goods shop he had leased, he was essentially caught red-handed. Wolfe was quickly apprehended, and the other gang members, all known associates of Wolfe, soon followed. It seems unthinkable that MI5 would be behind such a plan unless the gang agreed to deliberately take the fall for them. No serious intelligence operation would make such a basic mistake otherwise. There's no doubt that the Baker Street heist was brilliantly executed in some respects, but in other ways it was sloppy and amateurish. Allowing every detail of their plan to be broadcast over the airwaves seems another mistake uncharacteristic of a professional state intelligence operation. By 1971, CB radio was already massive in America and beginning to take off in the UK, despite still being technically outlawed. The robbers were talking to each other on open channels, potentially allowing any of the thousands of people in the area to hear their chatter. If MI5 were involved in planning the robbery, then they made some inexplicable errors which led to the certain capture of the thieves. The possibility that them getting caught and going to prison was part of the deal can't be overlooked, but it's a hefty price to pay however much the men were paid. The conspiracy theory that British intelligence was involved in the robbery to cover up a royal scandal is not outlandish, but it also revolves around their ability to suppress subsequent reporting using the D-Notice system. If they have such a powerful mechanism to cover up their activities, it begs the question as to why the robbery was even needed. Journalists in the 1970s already knew what kind of subjects were out of bounds. Princess Margaret's antics in Mustique were well-worn gossip in Fleet Street, as were the sexual proclivities of many other politicians and high-profile society figures. But like the often very public behavior of pedophiles such as Lord Boothby and MP Tom Dryberg, anything that could damage the establishment was already not reported by mutual agreement. Even today, pedophile scandals are rumbling on at the BBC and Westminster. Revelations continue that many high-profile establishment figures were routinely protected, a conspiracy of silence preventing them from being exposed. Elaborate bank robberies seem superfluous in the circumstances. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories 
as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. About eight years ago, I had moved to Houston, Texas. I didn't know many people, but I was religious at the time, so I joined a church. One of the members of the congregation worked at one of the Edwards theaters in town. He invited me to come to a movie, as he could sign in a guest on days that he was working. I decided to go see the movie The Help while it was in theaters. I was very excited because I'd been looking forward to seeing this film. I went to the theater and picked out a seat in the middle of one of the empty aisles. As more people filed in, one person decided to sit three seats down from me. This was the only person who was anywhere near me in the theater at all. About halfway through the movie, I felt a tug on my shirt. I thought it was the person next to me playing a joke on me, but when I looked over, the other patron was still three seats away from me, fully immersed in the movie. I think I'm just imagining things and go back to watching the film. About 20 minutes later, as I'm watching the movie, I feel another tug on my shirt, and by now I'm pretty angry, so I look over again, but the only person near me is the same patron, three seats away. I go back to watching the movie, still annoyed and suspicious of the person still seated three seats away from me. Fast forward a few months later, and my friend who worked at the theater started talking about the ghosts in the theater. He was very animated about this and told me about several different events that have happened more than once. To add some background to the area, the land that the theater is built on used to be a very large steel mill. There were supposedly several industrial accidents on the site over the years that it was still operational. My friend told me that there have been a few sightings of a soldier who was seen crawling up the stairs then disappears into a wall. This soldier has been seen by different individuals, according to my friend. He also said that people tend to feel uneasy if they see the specter and come out to notify management. By the time management gets to the specific auditorium, the soldier is always gone. Other patrons have reported having their clothes tugged on, as I had while watching movies, and there have been employee reports that the projection booth also has unexplained activity involving tugging of clothes. It's been a few years since I moved away from the Bayou City, but I don't think I will ever forget that theater. Back when I was supporting myself through college, I worked in a fast food restaurant in Omaha, Nebraska. I was walking back to the kitchen after cleaning a table on a regular day. I saw a little boy standing outside of the door. He just looked like a normal little kid, so I smiled and walked on and didn't think anything of it. He didn't have anyone with him, 
that I could see, so I asked him if he was lost. He just looked at me and smiled. I walked over, reached out my hand, and it went through him, like my hand went straight through him. I was completely shocked. He then turned and I watched him as he ran out and disappeared into the parking lot. I asked another member of the staff and she told me that several people had seen him. Nobody really knew anything about him or where he came from. Apparently, he would just make appearances every now and again, seemingly at random. Greystone Mansion, owned by the city of Beverly Hills for many years, is a place that is instantly recognizable for those who love movies and television. It has appeared in so many productions that the grand staircase at the entrance is said to be the most filmed and photographed stairs in Hollywood, but no thriller ever filmed there can boast the plot twists of the real-life murder mystery that occurred in the house in 1929. It began with two bodies in the bedroom, and it's never ended because the crime has never been solved, leaving a lingering mystery and a lingering haunting behind. The sprawling mansion was built in 1928 by Edward L. Doheny, an oil tycoon and rival of John D. Rockefeller. The mansion, designed by Gordon Kaufman, who had also built the Hoover Dam and the iconic Los Angeles Times building, cost over $4 million, which made it the most expensive home in Southern California at the time. Doheny himself never lived there. He had had the house built as a gift for his son, Edward Ned Doheny, Jr. But Ned didn't get to enjoy it for long. On February 16, 1929, just five months after he'd moved in with his wife Lucy and their five children, he was found dead in a guest bedroom in the east wing of the mansion. He was not alone. Also lying dead in the bedroom was his longtime friend and assistant, Hugh Plunkett. The events of the night were pieced together from Ned's wife, Lucy. She said that Plunkett had let himself into the house with his own key, as he always did, and went to the east wing. She had not been alarmed by anything until she heard a single gunshot. Lucy called the family doctor, not the police, E.C. Fishbaugh, and together they had gone to the East Wing. As they approached the bedroom, they saw Plunkett standing in the hallway, holding a gun and looking upset. He immediately rushed back into the bedroom, and another shot was fired. When Lucy and Dr. Fishbaugh entered the room, they discovered the bodies of both men. When the police arrived, veteran detectives became suspicious of this story. The witnesses seemed to have rehearsed their stories, and the sequence of events seemed questionable. Why had Lucy called the doctor first, not the police? Why did the bodies appear to have been moved? Why were the police not called until almost 2 a.m. when the shots had been fired between 11 and 11.30 p.m.? If Plunkett had committed suicide, how had he managed to shoot himself in the back of the head? But these questions were not asked for long. Within a few days, the official conclusion was that things had occurred just as Lucy had claimed, a murder-suicide, and the case was closed. A few detectives were unhappy about the decision, but the orders had come down from the top and any further investigation was stopped. Doheny and Plunkett were buried close to each other at Forest Lawn and that should have been the end of the story, but rumors still swirled around town about what really happened on the night of February 16th. Some made note of the fact that Doheny was buried at Forest Lawn, a secular cemetery, even though he was Catholic. His family made large donations to the church every year, and the only thing that would have prevented his burial in a Catholic cemetery was if he had committed suicide. So whose body was actually found first? What really happened that night? 
One unfounded rumor claimed that Ned and Hugh were lovers and that their deaths were the result of a fight about their relationship. In the 1920s, even in Hollywood, such relationships would have been kept secret. This story gained a lot of attention, with some alleging that Lucy had walked in on the two men and shot them both herself. In truth, though, this theory likely had nothing to do with what occurred that night. Around the time of Ned's death, his father, Doheny Sr., was embroiled in the Teapot Dome scandal. This bribery incident that took place during the administration of President Warren G. Harding and involved Secretary of the Interior Albert Bacon Fall, who leased Navy Petroleum Reserves at Teapot Dome in Wyoming and two other locations in California to private oil companies at low rates without competitive bidding. One of those companies was owned by Doheny, and in 1929, Fall was found guilty of accepting a $100,000 bribe from him. Both Ned and Hugh Plunkett had been implicated in the case, and it's most likely that the murder-suicide, regardless of who killed whom, was the result of a growing fear about their illegal business practices and the very real threat of prison time they were now facing. One of the men killed the other and then turned the gun on himself. Lucy Doheny and the trusted family physician were left to try and salvage some shred of decency for the family out of the entire mess or at least that's what may have happened. In truth, we will never know. But whatever happened that night, Greystone remains haunted after all of these years. The lingering spirit is not either of the men, but Ned's wife, Lucy. Lucy managed to weather the scandal of her husband's death, and a few years later, she remarried. She and her new husband, financier Lee Batson, continued to live in the mansion, raising her children. The couple later built and moved into a new home nearby, and Lucy sold the bulk of the Greystone estate in 1954. The mansion itself was sold in 1965 to a Chicago-based developer who never lived there. Instead, he rented it to movie studios. Later, the city of Beverly Hills bought the mansion, leasing it for a time to the American Film Institute, then turning it into a park. The mansion now plays host to private parties and is often featured in television shows and movies, including the critically acclaimed 2007 film about the early oil industry, There Will Be Blood. Lucy spent the rest of her life in her new home near Greystone. Towards the end, she lived to be a hundred and died in 1993, she would get dressed up each day and then sit in a wing-backed chair near the front door with her purse clenched in her hands she was apparently waiting for something, but she refused to say what it was she was waiting for. She never spoke publicly about what happened that deadly night in what the newspapers called the Palace of Grief, and perhaps that is why her ghost refuses to rest. Over the last two decades, there have been frequent reports of a ghostly woman who wanders the halls of Greystone, leaving traces of lilac perfume in her wake. Perhaps she still has a story to tell about a dark night in 1929, but whether she will ever tell is a mystery as chilling as the one surrounding the deaths of the two men that occurred that night. There aren't many 900-year-old stories that still captivate listeners, but one has stuck around for at least that long. Of course, when the said story involves children with green skin roaming the English countryside, it's a bit easier to understand the tale's longevity. There are three historical accounts from the 12th century detailing the appearance of these strange children, most notably William of Newburgh's. His History of English Affairs, written in Latin, gives us some of the earliest known stories of vampires and zombies returned from the dead. The three historical accounts vary slightly, 
but only in their details. During the reign of King Stephen, two children, apparently brother and sister, appeared mysteriously in the English village of Woolpit. Woolpit gets its name from wolf pits dug in the Middle Ages to protect the town from wild beasts. One autumn, during the harvest, villagers found the two strange children climbing out from one of those pits. They wore unusual clothing and spoke a language no one understood but the oddest thing about them was their green skin. The children were the color of leaves. They seemed confused by foods offered to them, eating only raw beans for many months. Stunned, the villagers of Woolpit nevertheless took in the young strangers. They even went so far as to baptize the children. The boy, who appeared to be younger than his sister, grew ill and died shortly after being baptized but the girl survived, and after a time she started eating other food and lost her green color. She also learned how to speak English so the villagers could finally learn her story. She said she and her brother came from a place called St. Martin's Land where everything was green. She said they had been herding their father's cattle when they followed the cows into a cave and became lost. They followed the sounds of bells and emerged in our world. One of the historians who recorded the Green Children's story says the girl was given the name Agnes and went to work as a servant in the household of one of the villagers, Richard Decane. She reportedly gained a reputation for being very wanton and impudent, but eventually settled down and married. Explanations for the origins and meanings of this story vary widely. Some later historians insist it is pure fairy tale but many say it probably has its roots in a true event. This was a period of civil strife throughout Europe. The children may have been orphaned or even kidnapped. There were many Flemish-speaking immigrants fleeing persecution and coming to England at the time. That may be the strange language the children spoke. And some diseases caused by malnutrition like anemia can turn the skin green. That might explain why the boy died and why his sister lost her green color after eating a larger variety of food. Whatever the origin of this story, it is likely that its endurance comes from the fact that it is about lost, vulnerable children who are also mysterious, otherworldly, and just a little frightening. The conflicting emotions of protectiveness and fear they invoke may be why this weird story still has the power to fascinate after 900 years. As a teenager, 18 years back, I had the opportunity to bloat my piggy bank by babysitting my neighbor's twins. They were seven years old and pretty naughty, but did all the things at the right time – eating, sleeping, playing, etc. Never had problems with them and loved to babysit them. Once I was asked to take care of them for eight hours – 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. on a Saturday. Kids usually go to bed by around nine-ish and I thought I'd have two hours to watch some TV shows so I was preparing the bed for the kids in their rooms when one of them asked if I could stay in the room with them. When I asked him why, he said he is scared to sleep alone and said that his mom usually stays in until they both sleep. I accepted and agreed to stay in until they both fell asleep. So I just started to narrate a bedtime story when I heard someone walking in the hallway It was quite surprising because Mrs. Beckerman told me she would reach home by 11 and it was around 9.15 p.m. I called out her name and I had no response. So the curious young blood of mine wanted me to go check who it was. I obliged my curiosity and stopped reading the story to the kids and stood up when I heard the noise again, this time more like running but just outside the door. The hallway is a straight line with rooms on both sides leading to the living room. I immediately opened the door and did not see anyone. Slowly getting scared inside, 
I brushed aside my assumptions and turned the lights on in every part of the house. I wanted to be brave as it would be hard to control the kids if they got paranoid, so I checked the house for any intruder, but no one was there. I bolted the doors again and walked back to the kids' room. Suddenly, I felt someone behind me, like a cold, heavy breathing. I turned back and no one was there. I once again brushed my thoughts aside and just told myself that my mind is tired. This time, the hallway seemed a bit cold, and that's not something that is common in Kansas in August. Nevertheless, I checked the temperature of the apartment and it was set to a fixed 75 degrees, but the temperature of the house was 63 degrees Fahrenheit. I was surprised because things were normal a few minutes back. I adjusted the temperature and waited until the temperature improved to 73 degrees. After that, I went to the kids' room. One of them asked why I looked so tense. I did not want to frighten the kids, so I did not say anything about my feeling. To lighten the mood, I made them sing and dance for a while, but that made them even more tired, so they quickly fell asleep. So by 10.15 p.m., I still had 45 minutes for Mrs. Beckerman to return. While I was trying to forget what happened earlier, the sense of being watched suddenly started to creep in. I decided to watch TV to divert myself. The moment I switched on the TV, I felt someone right next to me on the couch. I turned to my right and no one was there, but the feeling would just not go away. The reclining chair on the corner of the room started to shake as if someone touched it. I immediately turned my attention to the chair and noticed something that I cannot explain properly. It was a dark, dwarf-like shadow that just went past the chair. I was shocked, but then since there are trees in the neighborhood and the lights are on in the apartment, I immediately told myself that it's the shadow of the trees and I did not want my mind to believe that it was anything else. And then I turned back to the TV. I heard a loud bang in the kids' room and suddenly one of the twins started to cry. I ran to the room to see if he was all right, only to find him on the floor. He said the old man pushed him from the bed again. I was shocked. I told the kid, there is no old man in the apartment, it was just me and them. The kid showed his leg and I could see the imprint of a hand on the leg. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I ruled out the possibility that the other twin pulled him down as the mark on the leg was not from a kid's hand, it was as big as mine. I went out of the room to check the apartment, but as it happened before, the hallway was empty and no one was to be found. I locked the kid's room from inside and sat next to them. I comforted the kid and put him to bed and stayed in the room when I started hearing the footsteps again. I shouted by requesting whoever it was to leave the kids and go out of the apartment. The footsteps stopped right outside the door. I was not sure whether to open the door or not. After some five minutes, which seemed like an eternity, I opened the door and saw the same shadow, the one I saw next to the chair earlier, on the wall, unmoved. I kept staring at it for a few seconds when it slowly moved away and disappeared out of the hallway. Now, I was totally convinced that it was not the shadow of a tree because the hallway does not have any windows and the only light that falls in the hallway is from the light that was on. I started to panic and immediately called Mrs. Beckerman, who said that she'd be home in less than a minute. It was a big relief for me. I immediately narrated all the incidents to her as soon as she got back home and she rushed to the kids' room to see what happened to her son. She fell on her knees and started to cry, and then she said this is not the first time they were experiencing this. Thus far, the entity had never harmed her or her kids, so she never felt that it was trouble, but now, since it was able to touch and harm the kids, she was getting very worried. I called my mom, a tarot card reader with a bit of experience in communicating with spirits, to come to Mrs. Beckerman's house immediately. As soon as my mom entered the apartment, even before we narrated the story to her, she started to stare at the hallway and asked us if everything was okay. I was shocked to see my mom react this way, 
because she did not take her eyes off the hallway while asking us a few questions. This scared the crap out of me. But still, I kept asking my mom why she was staring at the hallway. She refused to answer and told Mrs. Beckerman to sleep at our house with the kids for the night. The next morning, my mom and Mrs. Beckerman invited a priest to their apartment to have it blessed. Post that incident, Mrs. Beckerman stayed there for a couple of years before she decided to move out of the colony owing to the transfer of her job from Kansas to Texas. Recently, five years back, when my mom and myself were having a discussion about how hard it was for her to raise me when I was young, I suddenly remembered this incident. Since I was old enough to understand her now, I asked her why she acted in such a way at Mrs. Beckerman's house that night. She explained that she saw a man who had a hunched back looking at us from the hallway. The man looked very upset and angry that she immediately felt a bout of negative energy run through her after entering the house. She, sensing that it was not advisable to stay there until the entity was controlled, asked Mrs. Beckerman to bring the kids and stay with us. I was speechless for a minute and then told my mom that I'm proud of myself that I still managed to safeguard the kids and survive two hours of hide-and-seek with the hunchback old man. I do not know who it was, and I have never seen that thing again, but those two grueling hours in the apartment has given me every reason to not forget the incident. Road dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, get your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shells stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while, grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. On a lonely night in 1946, President Harry S. Truman went to bed at 9 p.m. About six hours later, he heard it. Knock, knock, knock. The sound against his bedroom door awakened him. He wrote to his wife in a letter that is archived in his presidential library and museum, I jumped up and put on my bathrobe, opened the door, and no one there, he wrote went out and looked up and down the hall, looked in your room and Margie's, still no one, went back to bed after locking the doors, and there were footsteps in your room whose door I'd left open, jumped and looked and no one there. The damned place is haunted, sure as shooting. Secret Service said not even a watchman was up here at that hour. You and Margie had better come back and protect me before some of these ghosts carry me off. In addition to its political ghosts, the White House has long housed unsettling specters of a different, more bump-in-the-night kind, if numerous former leaders and their staff members are to be believed. Whether one embraces or mocks the paranormal, the many accounts that have spilled out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue over two centuries give ghosts an undeniable place in the country's history. They also make that address arguably the nation's most famous haunted house. The sightings, which have been documented in eerie detail by scholars and newspapers, involve a former president 
who appears when the nation needs a leader most, a daughter who pleads in vain to help her doomed mother, and a first lady who is, sadly, perpetually stuck doing laundry. Jared Broach is the founder of the company Nightly Spirits, which offers tours of haunted areas in several cities across the country. But when Broach started the tours in 2012, he offered only one – the White House. The White House has the best ghost stories, and I'd call them the most verified, Broach said. Honestly, we could do a 10-hour tour if we really wanted to. One of his favorite stories is about David Burns, who sold the land where the White House sits and whose voice has been reportedly heard in the Oval Office. I'm Mr. Burns, Broach would always say during tours when he got to that part of the story. Asked if he believes in ghosts, Broach said, for sure, and then pointed to more prestigious authorities. If I said no, I'd be calling about eight different presidents liars, he said. One of them would be Abraham Lincoln. He reportedly received regular visits from his son Willie, who died in the White House in 1862 at the age of 11 of what was probably typhoid fever. Mary Todd Lincoln, who was so grief-stricken by the loss that she remained in her room for weeks, spoke of seeing her son's ghost once at the foot of her bed. There were also reports of hearing Thomas Jefferson playing the violin and Andrew Jackson swearing. After his assassination in 1865, Lincoln apparently joined his son in the phantasmal roaming. First Lady Grace Coolidge spoke in magazine accounts of seeing him look out the window in what had been his office. Many more sightings would come in the decades and presidential administrations that followed. Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands was sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom in 1942 when she reportedly heard a knock on her bedroom door, opened it to see the bearded president, and fainted. Two years earlier, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, according to accounts, had just stepped out of a hot bath in that same room and was wearing nothing but a cigar when he encountered Lincoln by the fireplace. Good evening, Mr. President, Churchill reportedly said. You seem to have me at a disadvantage. In his research, Broach said he found that Lincoln seems to be the most common visitor among the White House ghosts and also the one who carries the greatest burden. They say Lincoln always comes back whenever he feels the country is in need or in peril, Broach said. They say he just strides up and down the second floor hallways and raps on doors and stands by windows. In a 1989 Washington Post article, White House curator Rex Scouten said that President Ronald Reagan had commented that his dog would go into any room except the Lincoln bedroom. He'd just stand outside the door and bark, Scouten said. Among other spirited stories are those about Annie Surratt. Some have sworn her ghost knocks on the front doors, pleading for the release of her mother, Mary Surratt, who was convicted of playing a role in Lincoln's assassination and later hanged. There are also haunting accounts involving two presidents' wives. Abigail Adams was the first lady to live in the White House and use the East Room to dry sheets. Since her death, there have been reported sightings of her likeness in that area. She walks, according to the accounts, with her arms outstretched, as if holding clean linens. Dolly Madison, if the stories about her are to be believed, seems to have chosen a better eternal pastime, taking care of the garden. During the Woodrow Wilson administration, staff members reported seeing her ghost as they were about to move the Rose Garden. They apparently decided afterward to leave it where she wanted it. The First Lady is also connected to another storied Washington location. When the British burned down their home during the War of 1812, she and President James Madison moved to the Octagon House on the corner of 18th Street and New York Avenue Northwest, making it the temporary White House. Unexplained occurrences there have been linked to the deaths of three women, including two daughters of the wealthy man who built the house. In both incidents, according to the newspaper accounts, the women had argued with their father about who they wanted to marry and then fell from the same staircase. Bells could be heard in the house when no one was there to ring them, reads a 1969 Washington Post article about the location. 
a specter of a girl in white could be seen slipping under the stairway. Terrifying screams and morbid groans could be heard emanating from the house. Some insisted that it was impossible to cross the hall at the foot of the stairwell on certain days without unconsciously going around some unseen obstacle on the floor. Newspapers once treated stories about ghosts with far less skepticism than they might today. Washington Post article published August 13, 1907, describes the police department's effort to address paranormal activity in Georgetown with the headline, Spooks Baffle Police. Despite the vigilance of Captain Schneider and his officers of the 7th Precinct, they continue, night after night, their weird and ghost-like tricks, the author wrote. The police are unable to stop the shower of gravel and stones, which appear to be the favorite means of manifestation of these materialistic ghosts, nor are they able to discover whence they came. The headline for a 1903 Post story which ran next to an advertisement offering a lawn swing for $3.95 said, White House Ghosts, Changes in the Mansion Have Driven Them Away. In the article, a longtime White House servant lamented how renovations had cleared the mansion of the spirits that kept him company on lonely nights. He described them as gliding up public stairways and down private ones. It's the truth, the gospel truth, said Jerry Smith, who was described as spending a quarter century at the White House. Times are not what they used to be about the house. Ever since I first went to the White House, I've seen the spirits of Mr. Lincoln and other presidents as they died. But you know that they don't like new places, and I never see a sight of Mr. Lincoln or General Grant. But Lincoln, it seems, would not be scared away so easily. Mary Eben, who worked for Eleanor Roosevelt, reportedly seeing him on his bed, pulling on his boots. Her screams apparently brought Secret Service agents running. Mrs. Roosevelt, in a 1932 talk about life in the White House, told a group in San Antonio that she felt another presence when she worked in a room where many presidents had also worked. I get a distinct feeling that there is somebody in the room, she said. After Truman wrote to his wife about the knocks on his door, the president's daughter wrote him back. Margaret Truman, in a 1986 biography of her mother, said she and her mom were skeptical of the existence of ghosts, presidential or otherwise, and she wrote her father saying so. In his reply, he said, I'm sure they're here, and I'm not so much alarmed at meeting up with any of them. I'm sure old Andrew Jackson could give me good advice and probably teach me good swear words, he wrote, according to the book, and I'm sure old Grover Cleveland could tell me some choice remarks to make to some political leaders, so I won't lock my doors or bar them either if any of the old coots in the pictures out in the hall want to come out of their frames for a friendly chat. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.